and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Ian Harditz. Happy Friday, everybody. Here we are, end of May. I hope everyone has a fantastic Memorial Day weekend. Until you go out there and drink for the entirety of the weekend, though, I encourage you to tune in because I have a very special guest on here today, the king and mastermind of the PFF Fantasy Social Account, president of the Will Fuller Fan Club, idiotic Michigan man supporter, Jared Evans, who you can follow on Twitter at PFF underscore Jared. Jared, man. Thanks for making the time and happy, uh, you know, May 27th, I guess. Yeah, Ian, thanks for uh, having me on. I feel like this is uh, a long time coming, but pumped to be here. I am uh, sort of extremely deep in a uh, best ball season, loving all the draft kit content that we've been getting up on the web- on the website and uh, just pumped to talk some football with you, chop it up a little bit. Yeah, as bad as my May 27th day was, we can fix that. It actually is Eat More Fruits and Vegetables Day. It's also National Great Popsicle Day, even National Gray Day. So my uh, favorite podcast to listen to is actually DC and Hawani over there with ESPN talking to all things UFC. And they always started off, you know, with the daily holidays. So I would, I love to steal their shtick from time to time. Check that out if you guys are interested in MMA. Without further ado, though, Jared and I are going to go through 10 questions, mostly related to some of the news while spare that has been occurring over the past months. So Jared, let's kick things off right away. Biggest topic in NFL circles, Julio freaking Jones gun to your head. Where's Julio playing in 2021? Well, sorry, Falcons fans. Julio is good as gone. There is no coming wow. back from going live on air with, with uh, Shannon sharp and skip Bayless. And uh, in his words, man, I'm out of there. So I have to say that I think he's going to go to the Patriots. There's only a few teams that can absorb his massive $23 million cap hit. And it makes so much sense from a real life perspective that the Patriots would go ahead and make that move for Julio. They have a history of sending receivers to new England, although Mohamed Sanu didn't exactly work out the last time. And the Patriots have a history of buying hall of fame wide receivers on the cheap in the back nine of their career. And last time I checked, it worked out pretty damn well with Randy Moss. So uh, it'll be a treat to see Julio lining up on the field with Cam Newton and uh, Bill Belichick when in his little hoodie somewhere uh, planning his little dark night uh... thesis. I guess you can call it a treat, man. I still think he goes back to Atlanta. We're really going to trade Julio freaking Jones. He asked for this trade months ago and they haven't been able to do anything just yet. Now I would say it's looking like similar to the Aaron Rodgers uh, situation that we've just kind of been hoodwinked and bamboozled by national media, making this a bigger issue before these guys are actually going to get traded because Julio like Aaron Rodgers, if they're traded before June 1st compared to after June 1st, just like massive, pretty much. $15 $15 million savings uh, on the cap for their teams. Now I realize they can come to principal on a trade that they then put through after June 1st, but that hasn't happened, man. Like I'm just waiting for it. Okay. He went on undisputed. It, we, we think he knew about it. I still haven't gotten like a final answer. If Julio even knew he was on live TV or not. And he said he's out of there and he said he doesn't want to play for the Cowboys. Julio doesn't have a no trade clause. He doesn't really have any say with where he goes. He, he wants to play for a winner. Unfortunately, Julio, it doesn't matter. And you look at these wide receivers, deep, not, you know, I, I don't want to call Julio a diva. The dude's one of the best wide receivers in the freaking league, but you look at wide receivers that just have requested trades, high profile wide receivers that have requested trades in recent years. There we go. That's what I wanted to say. Beckham gets sent to Cleveland. Antonio Brown gets sent to Buffalo before he throws a hissy fit, then gets sent to Vegas. Or at that point, they might've still been Oakland. Nobody knows for sure. Then we also had Stefan Diggs getting sent to Buffalo. I understand, you know, the Diggs trade and the Beckham trade in hindsight look a lot better. Let's face it. I don't think Cleveland and Buffalo are exactly where, you know, uh, 20 something NFL wide receivers are looking to spend uh, all their time. So for me, Julio, like, yeah, he does deserve a better. I hope he gets his wishes. Uh, not so sure the Falcons are going to abide. So, you know, if the Falcons aren't in like win now mode, like what are you, what are they doing, man? Julio isn't the guy to get rid of in that case. I think it'd be Matt Ryan. So to me, it's a great player that I don't think is going to be going anywhere. So we'll see, you know, I'm, I, I want to hold true. I think we've been marks this entire way. I think like Rogers, we're not going to see one of the best players at the position changing teams. Yeah, man, I agree with you. It doesn't make any sense for the Falcons, given their current roster construction to not at least give it one last shot with uh, Matt Ryan to try to win this year. But Hey man, Julio seems like he's asking to get the heck out of Atlanta. So, uh, he's not happy. He's not happy. And people are yeah. awfully, uh, yeah. 
optimistic about the potential situation. Julio, for those that don't know, has never scored more than 10 touchdowns in a season since high school. I actually did go back and make sure he cleared that threshold in high school. And he did against, you know, whatever poor future teachers he was dealing with there. But, you know, I asked my lovely Twitter followers, would Julio Jones score more than 10 touchdowns in a single season for the first time in his post high school career with Aaron Rodgers as his QB? We got 1200 votes and 83% say yes. So everybody is awfully confident that Julio can still put forward a career best year. And why not? I mean, it is Aaron Rodgers after all, but Jared transitioning here. This is a fantasy themed podcast. Where would you say is the best case in the worst case landing spot for Julio strictly for fantasy purposes? Cause as great as you said, he'd be in new England and yeah, Julio helps every single offense in the league. I get it. That wouldn't necessarily be a great spot for him in fantasy land. Yeah, I agree with you. I want to see Julio go to the Los Angeles Chargers and catch passes from Justin friggin Herbert. I think that would be so much fun. You'd have Herbert, Julio, Keenan Allen, Austin Eckler, big Mike Williams. You got Joe Lombardi calling plays. That offense would be a damn electric factory. The target shares would probably come down for Allen and Eckler, but I think their efficiency would more than make up from it from a fantasy perspective. And we've seen Plenty of offenses support three fantasy studs like those guys. And actually, I think we could see the Chargers really lean on the pass and just go super friggin' onslaught pass heavy, which would then make Austin Eckler a better fantasy running back because his question is obviously how many touches is he going to see in the running game? But if he's just getting, you know, 120 targets, then who the hell cares what the hell he's doing running the ball because he's a you know, top five running back easy. So then we would also get Julio versus the Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes twice a season. So I am fully on board with Julio to the Chargers. And then the worst landing spot, I mean, like you just said, there's really no team that's worse in fantasy or real life with Julio. But I think the Browns would not be an ideal landing spot. Yeah. They would have a ton of mouths to feed between OBJ, Landry, Chubb, and Hunt. And that is a run centric offense that I don't think would change their scheme. Kind of like the chargers would, I feel like open up the passing game a lot more now. Don't get me wrong. Julio Chubb, punt OBJ Landry. Like that would be fun as hell in, in real life. But for, uh, for fantasy, I, I don't know, but uh, Baker Mayfield stonks would go to the friggin' moon. So we, we'd get that at least. Ultimately, as much as, you know, we want to say like a dual threat quarterback opens up wider rushing lanes, a talent like Julio is going to pull coverage away. Those are all true and helping efficiency is great, but it doesn't make up for the amount of targets that or rush attempts that players lose in these situations. Crowded offenses just aren't great. So the Browns, you know, good point. And yeah, look, I'm banking on, I'm hoping for an OBJ comeback, but even then, man, I'm like, I don't think he's going to have enough volume. We're going to put another target hog into that system. It'd be an issue. Uh, I would say the Ravens honorable men mentioned just again, most run heavy offense two years in a row. I'm not saying, uh, I mean, look, it'd be great news for Lamar Jackson, but it's just tough to say at this point that Lamar Jackson can really enable anybody around him as a super consistent high end fantasy threat, the giants, because what the hell is going on there these days. And also maybe the 49ers, man, I know everyone keeps hoping he'll go there, but like Debo, I Kittle are still going to be involved. And even if Julio rises to the top, like I would say his talents deserve to like, what is the top going to be in this offense with Trey Lance, uh, man, like we're really assuming the 49ers are going to be this top five, top 10 scoring offense. And history really doesn't tell us that's the case, man. Like I think Kyle Shanahan is one of the smartest play callers in the league for sure. But yeah. If you go through his ranks from points per game, man, 2020, he was 21st, 2019, second. There we go. 2018, 21st, 2017, 20th, 2016. Oh my gosh, with the Falcons were first. 2015, 21st, 2014 with the Browns, 27th. With Washington from 2010 to 2013, he was 25th, 26th, 4th, and 23rd. And with Houston, he was 17th and 10th. Only three times in the past decade has Kyle Shanahan led a top 20 scoring offense, which is wild to me, man. And I'm not saying we shouldn't get behind them. The pieces are in place. You look at a lot of these years, and I think you'll you know look at the quarterbacks he was dealing with, and that kind of explains where some of the issue has been. But we need to be careful with all these mouths to feed in San Francisco that, like, 
like, okay, if Trey Lance isn't awesome as a rookie, which would be fair, he played one game last year. Like this should just be like, you know, a middling scoring offense. So I just think, you know, again, with all the volume concerns in San Francisco, uh, and then also the potential for Trey Lance to be this Taysom Hill type figure where he's going to be great for fantasy in his own right. Maybe not as teammates. I just find myself getting a little bit lower on these 49ers uh, skill position uh, receivers, at least uh, than I have been earlier in the off season. Finally, we just point out some other best case scenarios. Bills could work, man, just high end replacement for Smokey Brown. Cole Beasley's getting up there, you know, playing through a broken leg and all that. But Josh Allen wants to throw the ball to his heart's delight, put him there. Obviously the Titans and our guy, AJ Brown, who we'll talk more about in a second uh, are pushing for that. The chiefs could work, man, like replacing Sammy Watkins with Julio Jones. Let's freaking do it. There's been nine instances, uh, at least nine. I, I did a study from 2010 to 2019, nine instances of a QB one wide receiver, one or two wide receiver one or two in a tight end one on the same team. So I think Mahomes can pull it off. I had the chargers down. So I'm with you there. Dallas has just a high end Michael Gallup improvement, even though they don't need it, but it'd be okay. And then finally green Bay, of course, which brought us back to the poll. So good stuff there, but let's get to the Titans, Jerry, because friend of the podcast, AJ Brown has taken the Julio recruitment to staggering levels. I absolutely love it. And in the, his latest video, AJB actually called Julio the goat of our era among wide receivers. He's, not wrong. All right. And AJ Brown obviously knows far more about playing a wide receiver than either you or, or myself will know in our entire lifetimes, Jared. So giving Brown the benefit of the doubt is fine, but I want to know your opinion. Let's say the era post Moss 2010 to present, give me your top three, basically first team all decade wide receivers in order. All right. Our good friend, AJB is hundred percent. Correct. Julio is the goat of our wide receiver era. The, the running the running joke at PFF is that the yards per route run stat should be named after Julio Jones. He's ranked first among all receivers in that stat in 2013, 2015, 2016, 2017, and 2018. And in his other three non-rookie seasons, he also ranked in the top five. He's legitimately been the most efficient wide receiver of our generation. And of course he has the flash plays and the touch or not really the touchdowns, but everything else to boot. <laughs> uh, second, I'd go uh, Calvin Johnson. How can you not rank Megatron in the top three at the highest of highs? Nobody did it better than that, man. I was looking at his stats recently and his uh, 2012 season where he had 204 targets, 122 catches, <laughs> 1,964 receiving yards, uh -huh. but somehow only scored five friggin' touchdowns. Unreal. That is a number that Julio Jones would be proud of. <laughs> <laughs> but can you imagine Megatron in a modern pass heavy offense? My God, that would Bro, be Bro, he's amazing. only like 35, and I think, that, still. Like, come on, come on, Megatron. Go make another 10 All right, comeback season. Let's go, do it. Let's do it. Go to the he's Jaguars. got like his own like weed company now or something. <laughs> As he should. Go to the Jaguars. Yeah. All right, who's number three? Who's <laughs> and number then three? Uh, third, I was struggling here. I got, a, I got a tie between Antonio Brown and DeAndre Hopkins. Wow. Peak AB in Pittsburgh is probably better than any receiver in the 2010s, especially from fantasy. His six top five PPR, uh, top five PPR finishes in that stretch are more than any other receiver of the last decade. And he's got the second best career PFF receiving grade for any receiver trailing, of course, the goat Julio Jones and, uh, and Hopkins, man, he's, he's a baller. He's awesome. He, he ranks second to Brown with five top five PPR finishes over that stretch. And he only trails Julio in PFF grade since 2015. He's awesome. Don't have much to say. The only other shout out I wanted to give was an honorable mention to my boy, Jordy Nelson, his yeah. back shoulder fade mind melt connection with Aaron Rodgers was uncoverable. So that's, uh, that's probably what I go with for my all decade receivers. I respect it. You weren't too off base. I think quite a bit disrespectful to Antonio Brown, since we we're just talking on field uh, performance here, but let's, you know, just to paint a picture for the listeners out there of kind of some of the key contenders, only four wide receivers over the past decade racked up at least 10,000 receiving yards, Julio, Antonio Brown, Larry Fitzgerald, and Deandre Hopkins. Only, uh, only four had at least 65 touchdowns. Antonio Brown, my guy, Des Bryant, Jordy Nelson, and AJ green, uh, 
Brown and Dez were the only guys over 70. PFF's top five highest graded receivers, Julio, AB, Michael Thomas, DeAndre Hopkins, and Calvin Johnson, and some other honorable mentions. I said Keenan Allen, OBJ, Tyreek, Andre Johnson, Demarius Thomas, Brandon Marshall, and of course, Steve Smith. The problem with a lot of these guys, like I just think, you know, Fitzgerald and really, you know, Smith too. And, you know, uh, this, they didn't have like their peak years necessarily in the 2010 and on. Like Larry Fitzgerald has been playing for so long. He's at the top of these leaderboards. But like to me, when I think of Larry Fitzgerald, I think of his 2000, was it seven playoff run, you know, with Kurt Warner. So the fact that didn't come in the past decade, just I got to hold him back a little bit there. What year was that? Am I off base on that? That didn't happen last decade, did it? No, no, no. I don't think so. Okay. I'm going to be furious on myself with that because that would completely ruin <laughs> my argument. Okay. It happened in 2008. We're good. That was crazy. You know, put fits in the previous one. Fine. But for this one, I'm going number one, Antonio Brown, because at the end of the day, Jared points win football games. And nobody has been better at putting up points over the past decade than a B Antonio Brown, man has scored. Oh my gosh. I just had the stat up. He has scored 84 touchdowns compared to 60 for Julio Jones and four more games. That is it, man. So, you know, Julio, I get it. He does everything right except scoring touchdowns, but that's the point of the game. And we can talk about how touchdowns are more fluky, but I think at some point, man, and you know, people might press me on it, but I do think there's something about, you know, getting in that end zone is a skill to some extent. And Antonio Brown has been better at it than just about anyone else. So give me AB one Julio two, Calvin Johnson three with all all due respect to Fitz and DeAndre Hopkins, who I was trying to maybe squeeze in there as well, but couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. So good stuff on Julio there, Jared. Now let's move on to the next most unhappy man with his employer, Aaron Rodgers, sporting a man bun, showing in Hawaii, not going to OTA, just having himself a damn good time. Let's say the most popular trade destination comes true. Rodgers goes to Denver. Where are you ranking Rodgers as well as the running backs, wide receivers, and Noah Fant and PPR? Man, Rogers living it up in Hawaii. He just does not give a crap about anything right now, which is hysterical. Love it. But if he if he ends up in uh, in Denver, I think that his fantasy value from where it currently is right now would not really take too much of a hit because I think that kind of uncertainty is baked a bit into his ADP. You can draft Rogers in like the eighth or ninth round of most underdog fantasy drafts right now. Whereas I think if, you know, it was, everything was all hunky dory in, in green Bay and, uh, and, uh, he was, you know, ready to have an encore for his MVP season, then he'd probably be, you know, in that sixth round range. So I don't worry too much about Rogers there, but man, you got to get excited about the, Broncos pass catchers like my god it would be an absolute fantasy points party with those guys I I would say Corlin Sutton would move up to that like Mike Evans range in the in the fourth round of fantasy drafts you get like Jerry Judy up into that like T Higgins range in the fifth six Noah Fan in that like TJ Hawkinson Mark Andrews Kyle Pitts tier I think uh, it would just be awesome for all those receivers because look, you know, Drew Locke, we love his swag, not really the most accurate passer and uh, Teddy Bridgewater, what he does, what he lacks in the Drew Locke YOLO throw it up downfield. You know, at least he's a little more accurate for, for the short range stuff, but not nowhere near the MVP level of Rogers. And then for the, for the running backs, I think it would move up Javante Williams into that, like Miles Sanders tier, like the end of the third, early fourth range. I think he could have like a Jonathan Taylor slash JK Dobbins season from last year where they start out in kind of a timeshare and then emerge into a fantasy difference maker that wins people championships come uh, fantasy playoff time. And uh, definitely give me Williams over Melvin Gordon, who uh, might go the way of Mark Ingram this year. So, uh, yeah, if uh, Rogers, man, don't do it. I will say, man, you know, I, of course, I always need to apologize for Drew Locke. One more touchdown than Teddy, only four additional picks in two fewer games. Didn't have Cortland Sutton for 31 snaps. Jerry Judy dropping everything. Teddy was in a better environment and Drew Locke still put up better numbers. But I fully realize that the answer to Drew Locke versus Teddy Bridgewater is almost certainly no. And Aaron Rodgers being there would be fantastic. So he'd be my QB six behind only Mahomes, Josh Allen, Kyler, Dak, and Lamar. We play a game called fantasy football that rewards dual threat quarterbacks. Wherever Rodgers goes, he is not going to be a dual threat quarterback anymore at this stage in his career. Although it was crazy, man, like 2015, 2016, when they were like really 
you know, trying to play Ty Montgomery at running back. He's getting hurt. They had no one. There was a year I think Rodgers actually led them in rushing. Those days are behind us. He can still move, but he's just not putting up the yards. Yeah, the running backs are interesting, man. I'm just wondering though, like we might be overrating Javante a little bit. Like Melvin Gordon. If he is on the team, which I don't know, he's talking about, you know, putting Javante under his arm, you know, saying that Danny Woodhead did that for him when he was younger and stuff. It seems like Gordon who had the late season DUI, I think I probably put a little too much stock in. I don't think he's really going to be cut. He's not someone I really want. I've kind of compared him to this year's Leonard Fournette, but the difference is Fournette was going as like a top 12, top 15 running back. And Gordon right now is outside of the top 30. So for zero RB guys out there, if you think this is going to be a spot where Rod goes i mean gordon and javante to me are like better versions of you know the buccaneers backs or the bills backs that you're going to be getting because it could be a far more fantasy friendly offense there so javante you know might be dropping a little more in my ranks but i think you'll be happy with having him or maybe even melvin on the squad if rogers goes there yeah i think he nailed the wide receivers i would put them really both in my tier threes uh wide receiver 16 18 range right there with the buccaneers falcons a little bit higher i mean a little bit beneath the falcons wide receiver cincinnati guys there as well and don't even sleep on kj hamler and to a lesser extent tim patrick man just as later round darts Noah fan will go in front of mark andrews for me and become the tight end six currently have him as the tight end eight yeah people shocker you put aaron Rodgers in an offense every single person involved is going to be a bit better looking in fantasy land on the other side of the coin though jared how do you rank jordan love as well as these packers rb's wide receiver and robert tunyon if Rodgers ends up leaving town shudder at the thought of, uh, of this scenario as PFF fantasy's resident Packers fan. But, uh, I actually don't think it would be a complete disaster. You know, Matt LaFleur is one of the best play callers, I think in the, in the NFL and Jordan love is certainly no Aaron Rodgers, but I think LaFleur can call, uh, enough of a friendly offense to put him in places to succeed where he's not, you know, throwing missiles like 30 yards downfield and into tight windows. I think they'll be doing lots more screens and just like getting players in space to work after the catch. And love also has Devonte Adams and Aaron Jones at his disposal, two of the best players at their respective positions. So I think, I mean, love doesn't, you know, he's, he's mobile, but he's not going to be like a true dual threat guy. So he's probably going to be in that, like, back end or like mid range QB two, nothing, you know, too exciting from, um, for fantasy purposes. Devonte Adams, I think takes the biggest hit. We saw what life is like for him without Rogers back in 2017, when he was catching passes from Brett Hundley, he was solid. He was the overall wide receiver seven that year with 15.9 PPR points per game, but he wasn't a world beater. He had 885 yards, 10 touchdowns. It was, a, it was a solid year. It wasn't spectacular. I'd probably drop him from wide receiver one to wide receiver six behind AJ Brown, Stefan Diggs, Tyree kill yeah. Calvin Ridley and Deandre Hopkins. And then for Aaron Jones, I think he would be fine because what he'd lose in touchdowns, I think he gains in touches because they lean on the run a little more. And then the Packers also are not going to be a uh, 14 and three now or 13 and four team, you know, probably competing for the, for the one seed in the NFC. So they're going to be doing a lot more losing, which probably means a lot more uh, check downs, shameless PPR points via receptions since uh, they'll probably be chasing points and not, uh, and not being the fire breathing offensive unit that they were last year. And uh, big Bob Tanya and MVS hard to get excited about either of, of those guys without, without Rogers in town. But uh, Aaron Jones, totally fine. Uh, keep drafting him as an RB1 regardless. Yeah, Jordan Love is going to be in the early 20s with me. I'm taking, you know, Fields, Lance, Lawrence, Fitzpatrick, all ahead of him. He never had even 50 rushing yards in a game at Utah State, only averaged 10 per game. He seems like an athletic guy, but maybe one of those, you know, athletic enough to get outside the pocket and, you know, get the occasional yards they want to give you. Just not someone I'm expecting to have enough efficiency to be a fantasy difference maker. Yeah, Aaron Jones, I think, would be the guy where we'd be forced to slide him down a little bit, but then he'd be a value where he's going because, like, with Jamal leaving, that 
that's fine if A.J. Dillon comes and takes Jamal's early down rushing work. It doesn't look like he's going to be taking the targets, and that's huge. It's like a Joe Mixon situation, man, where we have Aaron Jones. We know he can catch the ball. He just hasn't really had a chance to do that all the time over the past few years, and now he's in a situation where the offense no longer has the back that typically was stealing those targets from him. So, yeah, he might have enough volume to overcome the decrease in touchdown efficiency. Uh, Devontae Adams, yeah, he was the PPR wide receiver 12 during a specific stretch stretch when Hunley was under center. So that's great. But yeah, I mean, he's definitely closer to borderline wide receiver one, same thing as Alvin Kamara. People are like, how can you not have him as a top five RB, you know, anymore? It's because in the most recent sample we have of him without Drew Brees, he wasn't. So why are we going to go back and say he will be? So, uh, you know, Dylan, Hey, he might be a decent late round option, regardless of what happens, man. I mean, we don't have to go back to 2018 when Matt LaFleur gave Derrick Henry 230 touches and Deion Lewis, 214 touches. So Dylan's going to be really involved. And I mean, God, forbid Rogers doesn't leave. He's honestly going to be a value where he's going, you know, as like an RB 35 range. So yeah, Devonte, I'd slide down, you know, even wide receiver six might be a little generous, man. I think wide receiver eight, wide receiver nine, still top 10, but uh, you know, I'd be staying away from basically everybody else because the snaps and stuff were just, two up in the air. I mean, I think Amari Rogers is going to take over for Lazard at some point, probably not in week one, you know, MVS, you know, could easily his snap and his role kind of seems to come and go. I'm happy he held on to it last year. That's hardly been the case throughout his career. And with Tunyon, even though he had like the most efficient season of all time last year, if you want to just look at, you know, touchdowns versus incomplete targets, certainly uh, could see that, you know, falling off a, a rather steep cliff without a Aaron under center. But people, if you think Jared and I are off base on this, I encourage you to listen to the rest of our PFF podcast network, which covers everything NFL college and fantasy football I'll recap the NFL draft with Mike Renner and Austin Gales, two for one drafts podcast, or get all the 2021 betting content you need with the PFF forecast. Uh, always fun, especially in my mind with the two for one drafts podcast with Austin getting to interview some of these college coaches uh, over, over the last few weeks. So make sure you check those out. Out. All right, Jerry, we've talked enough about Julio and Rogers and all that. Now we're getting on some more actual news that has come to fruition and might not just be ridiculous May rumors. So uh, low-key injury news that happened this week, Jeff Wilson, due to meniscus surgery, will begin the season on the reserve uh, slash pup list, meaning he'll miss at least six games. So the timeline is actually apparently four to six months. It was like a post weightlifting accident. I don't, I don't know what the hell happened here, but it sounds like it was something dumb, which is unfortunate, man. Like Jeff was someone when we were doing these, you know, pre draft, uh, best balls. It was a value because we were kind of expecting him to be the RB two. And that is what came out. I mean, the athletics, Matt Barrow has reported that Wilson was the RB two behind Raheem Mostert. And now Wayne Gallman is that guy for now, a little bit problematic that that's already seemingly set in stone or clear enough to the guys. But Jared, what are we making of this 49ers, uh, offense as a whole? I guess we've talked about them a little bit earlier, but specifically the running backs, man, I got to say, stepping up to uh, the 49ers running back roulette wheel is a terrifying thought for fantasy managers. I have PTSD trying to guess between Raheem Mostert and Tevin Coleman and Jermichael Hasty and all these guys, Jeff Wilson, over the last couple seasons. So, you know, Trey Sermon right now, obviously the 49ers traded up for him in round three. So clearly they're excited about him. His ADP right now is the eighth round, which is fine. But I think this Jeff Wilson injury is going to pump that up to like the fifth, sixth, maybe even the fourth round range as people get that rookie fever closer to uh, redraft fantasy season. And at that price, I am definitely going to be out on Trey Sermon. I would rather have Raheem Mostert at the cheaper price tag, who is legitimately one of the fastest running backs in the NFL. And we've seen him be an absolute beast in, uh, in fantasy football and in real life. I uh, have vivid nightmares about what he did to my Packers in the NFC championship game a couple of years ago. But, uh, the other guy that's kind of interesting is Elijah Mitchell. I know the 49ers really like him. He was their sixth round draft pick. He's a really talented guy. Uh, our good buddy, Andrew Erickson called him this year's James Robinson before the draft, which actually was a little too bullish because he ended up getting drafted. But I think that was just to say that he's a talented guy who was going to be picked, you know, towards the end or kind of off the radar of, uh, of fantasy players, but somebody who in the right situation could be an interesting piece. And, uh, any of these guys, if they get the lead job, it's just complete party because the 49ers run the ball. They have that amazing scheme. It's just a matter of guessing which one is going to be the guy any given week. And it's 
damn impossible, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's juicy. It's exciting. The, the risk reward, man. Look, I'm happy sermon was the RB four. I think he deserved to be, and he landed in a great situation. He's the, he was the 88th overall pick. How the hell does he already go? Is he going before Raheem Mostert and underdog, man? I was shocked. I was all aboard Raheem Mostert late round RB season before the draft. And when they brought in sermon, I, you know, kind of jumped off cause it just didn't help. And I wasn't going to buy, you know, Mostert at his, you know, kind of growing price, but no, it's actually been great. Cause now sermon is somehow more expensive and now we can get the 49ers projected RB one as their RB two, because people are freaking obsessed with rookies, man. Like it's not even a guarantee that sermon beats out Elijah Mitchell. Kyle Shanahan's like the one coach that we should be feel pretty confident in not caring that much about the draft capital or, you know, financial resources invested in these guys, but you hit the nail on the head with the speed, man. Only two guys to hit 23 miles per hour in the next gen stats database, Raheem Moster and some other dude named Tyree kill. So he truly is that fast. I'm, you know, maybe Wayne Gallman is the cheapest guy that we're kind of missing here because if he is going to be getting that Jeff Wilson role and Gallman can play on all three downs, man, I actually thought he was the best uh, post Barkley running back. The giants were going with last year. I mean, better than Deion Lewis and Devonte Freeman's corpses here. I'm going out on a real big, uh, you know, stretch here, but for him to average, you know, 4.6 yards per carry behind one of the worst offensive lines we were really seeing last year. I mean, he was, he did flash occasionally. So, you know, Wayne Gallman's maybe someone where if he's there in the last round of the draft, uh, uh, don't, don't be afraid to, you know, pull a trigger on there. Now that we have this Jeff Wilson news and seriously, people, zero, if you're a zero, if you're running a zero RB team and you're not coming away with Raheem Mostert, you are doing something wrong. Jared, use that social graphic, man. Yeah, that's the one we want. I don't want freaking, you know, to have to defend my Joe Mixon over Jonathan Taylor freaking take for 12 straight hours again. Will you people lay off? Jonathan Taylor averaged 0.25 more PPR points per game than Mixon last year. Jonathan Taylor's scat back is still there. Geo's is gone. I know the Colts offensive line is better, but Burrow's better than once. The freaking Bengals to score more points than the Colts this year, and it wouldn't be that crazy. So I understand. If you want to put Jonathan Taylor over Joe Mixon, that's fine. I'm not calling you an idiot, but quit calling me one when I say the opposite. So with that, let it out, Ian. Let it out. Had to get that one off my chest here. It's been a it's been a lot of clown emojis in the old mentions over the past uh, few days, but all right, Jared, moving on now, fun and annoying at the same time, off season storyline. It's our first, this player is moving into the slot. So everything's going to be great. Now after a disappointing year, Mr. Jalen Rager is this year's participant. We got Devonte Smith entering the offense. Zachard still has not been traded. Give me your general thoughts on the Eagles offense going to next year. All right. So I think the, the Eagles offense starts with Jalen hurts QB one season. He's just at the epitome of a dual threat cheat code. Only quarterbacks who had more fantasy points when he was the starting quarterback through weeks, 14 to 16 last year, were Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson hurts hurts led all starting quarterbacks with a 10.1 yard average depth of target, not afraid to sling it deep. I mean, that's exactly what we're looking for in fantasy quarterbacks. who are going to throw down field and run. So yeah. hurts QB one all day, every day. We love that. I'm stoked for Devonta Smith. He was my wide receiver two behind Jamar chase in this class back at Alabama in 2019, when he was playing with Judy Waddle and rugs, it was Devonta Smith who was in the coveted X role. And, you know, if Saban had Devonta Smith basically as the number one receiver there, I mean, who am I to, <laughs> to disagree with, with the legend himself? I mean, Smith, he's, doesn't have any flaws to his game. He's a little skinny. All right. whoop de doo <laughs> but, uh, 1900 or 1856 receiving yards last year, 23 touchdowns, 94.9 PFF grade. I mean, dude's a monster. I'm going to be drafting him a ton this year. Rager is the one who's a little interesting because rookies struggle in their, in their first season in the NFL. It friggin' happens. I mean, Devonte Adams barely looked like an NFL player through his first two years. And now he is literally the best receiver in the NFL. So I'm not giving up on, on Rager yet. I'm not giving up on rugs yet either. I mean, none of these guys cost anything in fantasy drafts. You can get them in like the 12th round or the 13th round. So they're worth late round dart throws. And then the last guy here worth, uh, worth mentioning is Miles Sanders. That man broke my heart last year, but I'm ready to get hurt again. No, Jared, no. <laughs> I mean, he's not a, he's, he's not a premier target, but like on teams where I'm loading up on AJ Brown, 
and I'm looking for a running back in the third round or the fourth round, then, you know, I could get on board with, with Sanders. I think, you know, you got Sirianni in at, at head coach now. So that kind of changes the expectation for what they might do in terms of having a running back by committee Sanders talent, not a question for him. He averaged 5.3 yards per carry last year, only trailing a couple guys like JK Dobbins, Nick Chubb, Aaron Jones, and Derek Henry, pretty good company. It's a crowded backfield, but, uh, it's, uh, it's worth the, the cost in, in my mind, if I'm looking for a running back in that in that range. Yeah. I mean, look, Miles Sanders, he's had a hard enough time getting this three down roll. Now he's got a coach that wouldn't, I don't know, wouldn't feature Jonathan Taylor until the starter got hurt in week one. And then, you know, not until week 10 or 11, as much as, you know, everyone likes to pretend that Taylor was just dominant week in and week out last year. God, I can't stop talking about this guy in every answer, but uh, man, the bigger issue for me is just the potential for Jalen Hurts to almost become this like Taysom Hill S guy and just kind of sucking the life out of his offense. Same thing with Trey Lance and Lamar Jackson. When you run this much, it's just really hard for your other players around you to put up big numbers like Dak and Josh Allen run too. But you know, a lot of times they just focus more inside the 10 yard line, you know, makes them great fantasy players, but they can still put up really big receivers. It's concerning when Jalen hurts. If you extrapolate his four game rushing total over 16 games, he was on pace to break the positions record for rush attempts. And that's great for Jalen hurts QB one season. The problem is if we're not going to have a high end passing volume, then I, I don't know, man, it's going to be a problem because Hurts last year. I mean, the only guys with the worst PFF passing grade were Sam Darnold, Dwayne Haskins, and Jake Luton. He was throwing the ball downfield, got over 300 yards twice. That's great. I guess we shouldn't really care how pretty it is, how he gets the yards as long as he does here over in fantasy land. But I'm just worried with all that said, man, I was on a podcast last night going through this when they asked me about a uh, Devonte Smith. And I kind of thought I was like lower on him than the ranks. Apparently I'm really high on him. As much as I just spend my day arguing with people about Cam Akers being my RB 10 mixing RB 11 and Taylor RB 12. I have Devonte Smith as my wide receiver 26 and he's got an underdog ADP as a wide receiver, like 37 right now. So, Hey, I guess I'm inexplicably Manning, or at least I'm not, I'm in the front seat of the Devonte Smith wide receiver two bandwagon this year. So let's get it. I'd roll the dice on Devonte over, you know, Chark, Robbie Anderson, your guy, Will Fuller, Debo, even probably OBJ, all guys who have a higher ADP. I do think his uh, target volume just has that potential because, you know, Rager, I get it. In TCU, he had, you know, the worst case quarterback play last year at injuries again, pretty bad quarterback play, but I don't know, man, he, he's a value. Like he's going behind Marvin Jones, which is a slap in the face. So I'll, I'll say that much. It's just, I do wonder I, I'm in for, I'm in on Devonte Smith, but it hurts really good to be able to enable more than one uh, fantasy relevant wide receiver. Not so sure. But uh, with that Marvin Jones reminder, I do want to give everyone uh, just my updated, you know, ages list. These are older players that I do not want to touch because they're old in football years, not necessarily because uh, you know, they're old in real life. You can be Ryan Fitzpatrick, but still be playing at a very high level. So my ages list right now is AJ Green, Larry Fitzgerald, T.Y. Hilton, Manny Sanders, Julian Edelman. Oh, he retired. I guess we can cross him off. Marvin Jones, David Johnson, Mark Ingram, Adrian Peterson, Frank Gore, Zach Ertz, Rob Gronkowski, and Jared Cook. So we'll see. Might be a year early, but I would rather be a year early than too late with some of these guys. So keep that in mind, even though you might think someone's of value if they can't freaking, you know, do anything these days. Uh, father time is undefeated after all. Jared, I gave you this list of questions yesterday around, you know, six or seven o'clock in the small time between then and our recording window, my Antonio Brown, why could he not be considered a value right now? Question has been thrown up into the air because to, as Tampa Bay times, Matt Baker reports, if he was sued by KCB marketing for allegedly failing to pay commission on more than 2 million in earnings. We've had the celebrity chef, the personal trainer. Now KCB marketing suing Antonio Brown does not seem like something that's going to result in a suspension, but it's certainly not, you know, it's for Antonio Brown. Not all news is good news. Let's put it that way. And this has not exactly been a great news cycle for him stretching all the way back to 2018. With all that said, Jared, my goodness, he's going as the wide receiver 47 right now. How can you leave a best ball draft without Antonio Brown? Yeah. I mean, I guess it's just, uh, just another day in the life of, uh, Antonio Brown doesn't seem, uh, doesn't seem too surprising, but there's no doubt he's a great value in drafts. His underdog ADP is at 106. And down the stretch, he was a friggin' monster. He scored 20.3 fantasy points, 
36.8 in his last three regular season games. And now he gets basically a full off season to kind of acclimate to whatever game plan Bruce Arians is installing. And maybe he can have a little more sleepovers with uh, Tom Brady to develop that uh, connection a little more. But yeah, man, I mean, talent is never a question with, with AB, it's just a matter of whether he can stay on the field. And at that price, how can you not be on board? I understand people hate Antonio Brown, but you can't, you can't just erase what he did last year in PPR points per game. Goblin was the wide receiver 15. Evans was the wide receiver 16. AB was the wide receiver 23 targets in 12 games together. Goblin 85 Evans, 84 AB 74. Like it was pretty much a three wide receiver two offense. And f- speaking fantasy, just a top 24 wide receivers. They had three of them. Goblin is wide receiver 18 ADP. Evans is wide receiver 15 ADP. But everyone's just like, screw you, AB. We're done with it. So, man, like if he they didn't bring him back, now there's there's some concern before now. But you know he passed the physical. He signed his contract. He is going to be out there in three wide receiver sets. And the only two players and one of our new uh, stats I really like threat rate, which is just targets per route run. Uh, the only two guys that were targeted more often on their routes last year were Devonte freaking Adams and Braxton Berrios for some silly Adam Gase induced. Re- and so, I mean, unfortunately, we can't buy Braxton Berrios this year. So buy Antonio Brown instead. And hey, if you want to go do that, and if you like fantasy football, and if you like playing fantasy for money, you need to check out Underdog Fantasy. Underdog's got everything, including season long and playoff best ball. Best ball is a season long game where you draft the team like you normally do, but that's it. There's no in season roster management. Underdog automatically selects your best performers each week, saving you loads of time. So go to Underdog Fantasy and deposit $10 using promo code PFF and get a free PFF edge and description as promo code PFF. Draft now at Underdog dog fancy Jared two more questions Dak Prescott is throwing and looking good we're talking mostly redraft 2021 stuff here but how many QBs would you take ahead of Dak Prescott in a dynasty draft at this very moment in time all right Patrick Mahomes Josh Allen Lamar Jackson Kyler Murray Justin Herbert Dak Prescott that's that's the list for me in uh, in dynasty quarterbacks I'm a yeah, yeah, but for but for 2021, man, the Cowboys' offense are basically running back the same team that they had last year. And through the first five games, Dak Prescott averaged 27.1 fantasy points per game, which would have ranked most among all quarterbacks last season. And it is just like half a fantasy point per game less than what Lamar Jackson had in his MVP 2019 season. So that is dominant fantasy performance. The Cowboys defense stinks. They're going to be passing up a storm through week five. Dak had 15 more pass attempts and 269 more passing yards than any other quarterback. He's going to be thrown to Amari Cooper, CD lamb, Michael Gallup. I mean, how can you not be all over that for, for 2021? Bro, in the offense, like he was doing all that. That's what made it so impressive. We've seen Dak, you know, in 2017 when Tyron Smith missed some time, Des Bryant gets a little washed up. He did not play well for most of that year. 2018, before they got Amari Cooper, really tough time throwing the ball. I mean, we had seen Dak really have some lows when the Cowboys offense wasn't just loaded around him until last year. Tyron Smith played two games. Lowell Collins didn't play the entire season. So no starting tackles. Zach Martin ended up missing six games at the end of the year. He was like, like the only like redeeming quality of this group that had for a long time been the NFL's, you know, really elite uh, just in terms of the entire position group. So Dak, for him to overcome all that, even if the defense is better and we don't get the same short shootouts, I, I would not guess that. I do think they'll continue to suck uh, just like you were saying, Jared, but even if that happens and we don't see that same volume, we could reasonably predict Dak having a boost in efficiency because of the offensive line, because of CD taking a step forward and just having more overall experience again in this offense so uh, I would I'd say Mahomes is the only one you would absolutely say yes over I would definitely go Josh Allen Kyler as well I think I would side Dak and even ahead of Lamar ahead of Herbert and ahead of I think Joe Burrow who I would say is the last quarterback that kind of deserves to be in that tier maybe I'm stretching a little bit on Burrow but we are on the same page either way there Jared now, final question. We got a quote from the always entertaining Super Bowl champion head coach, Bruce Arians. Now, I just want to say, people, like Bruce Arians, when you hear him talk about running backs, it is almost always a joke. I mean, he just cannot talk enough about how much he wants to give his, whoever starting running back is at the time a ton of touches. There was this past offseason when he said, Ronald well, Jones needs to have 20 touches. He said in, let's see, 2017 that he wanted David Johnson to get 30 touches 
carries a game. He said in 2017, he wanted Adrian Peterson getting 25 carries per game. And who can forget in 2015 when Andre Ellington was supposed to get 20 touches per game. So when I saw Arians had talked about his backfield, I was fully expecting him to say like both Fournette and Ronald Jones were going to get 20 touches per game. That's not what he said though. For once Arians might actually be calling it straight with us. So this was his quote of all the positions. It's probably the one where those two guys will compete, but they're both going to play. They're so talented and they both bring so much to the table. Hopefully if they're both healthy, they're splitting time. I know fantasy doesn't like that. Bruce, we do not. Uh, but those two guys, I mean, Rojo's one of the best runners I've been around. Lenny had that great run in the playoffs. Bruce is not wrong on either statement. He showed what they drafted him for in the top five. So we're blessed to have this group of backs with Keyshawn and Gio. It's a hell of a group. Yeah. And that's the problem, man, for me, because last year, somehow Rojo and Fournette, two, who should be on anybody's short list of the worst receiving backs in the league, despite them getting, despite Fournette inexplicably getting all these targets over the past two years, they combined for 89 targets. They brought in Giovanni Bernard. We can see that target total cut in half. Jared with Arians, just straight up admitting it's going to be a committee. Do you want anything to do with this backfield and fancy land? I mean, it's just a, it's just a price thing, right? Like these guys are just being drafted so late that I think it's probably worth throwing darts at, especially if you're building those zero RB or modified zero RB type rosters, where you're trying to like shoot for the moon, basically with, with these running back slots, because I mean, look, we saw that Leonard Fournette can be a fantasy stud when given a workload in this offense. And the bucks are going to have one of the best offenses in the NFL this year. I mean, his Lombardi Lenny reign of terror through the playoffs had 23.2 fantasy or 23.2 fantasy points in the first game, 21.7. 18.4 and then 23.5. Like that is bona fide top five running back production. Oh, do you and go Rojo for net over Rojo? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would Ooh. go, I would go for net over, over Rojo. I mean, Rojo was, was healthy and, and playing and Fournette was still the one who was, he wasn't the really healthy in the playoffs. He, I remember him like having a nice run against the saints and like literally limping directly back to the bench. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Fournette, yeah, yeah. Fournette was, right. Fournette was a better back in the playoffs. It's going to be split, but Rojo was, you know, pretty damn good runner during the year. I, I think he's, you said it best earlier, zero RB there's delight. Go ahead and go get these guys. Just don't reach on them. All right, people, we want to take players that have a theoretical upside and have a theoretical ceiling. We're trying to get first place first or last. And, you know, if you want to go zero RB, then, okay, you're targeting guys in a great offense. I would say AJ Dillon, Gus Edwards, Zach Moss. I mean, they also apply and they're going in a similar range. Just, uh, you know, realize we're not getting those targets. And if these guys are both going to stay healthy and be split accordingly, it's not going to be fantastic bonus. Final 11th thought though, Jared Adam Vinatieri retired. Congrats to him on being the goat of the position. I do. I would actually love to see the NFL retire kickers in honor of Adam Vinatieri. Let's just end it. You know, no one's ever going to be better than Adam Vinatieri. Let's just admit the whole kicker idea was stupid and move forward. Any thoughts about Adam Vinatieri's career, Jared, if you maybe don't hate the position as much as I do. I mean, he's, he, he's the goat. My one thing to say about Vinatieri is if I ever find myself in some random situation where my life depends on someone drilling a 40 yard field goal, then I'm using my phone, a friend button to call up and, and Vinatieri. <laughs> congrats to him at to Hall of Fame career legend goat. Enjoy retirement. I slander kickers so much in every platform that decides to give me, you know, a voice. And one of these days, you know, Pat McAfee is just going to eviscerate me, bring up all these good points or kick my ass in real life because he absolutely could. So maybe I need to start showing out. I mean, now I, I guess if you can deal with a lot of fans and maybe even teammates hating you being an NFL kicker, would be pretty awesome. We had a uh, Peter Overset who's, you know, just a, uh, thought leader in our fantasy community over at underdog fantasy now. But when I, I had him on the podcast and I asked like what NFL player would you like want to most like switch kind of lives with? And his answer was Jason Sanders, the dolphins kicker. And you know what? Yeah. It's, I just, Pete was on this podcast. I think during the season, like six, seven months ago, I think about that answer a lot. And I'm starting to unfortunately just wonder like, damn, as much as I hate kickers, being an NFL kicker will be pretty awesome. Jared, you're awesome, man. Everyone can follow you on Twitter at PFF underscore Jared. I understand you're going to be on vacation in sunshine, Arizona next week, but let the people know what you got in the docket plan for the rest of the off season. Yeah, man, this, this off season, the next couple of weeks, it's going to be all best ball all day, every day. Come, uh, come draft with me in the underdog, uh, best ball mania tournament. Anytime hit me up on Twitter. I'm always down to, to banter with you guys. And, uh, yeah, Ian, it's been fun. Thanks for having me on.
Bo Showman. And yes, people, please continue to support the podcast. We've got that having the fantasy files out every single day, along with one article over on PFF.com. So he's Jared Evans. I'm Ian Hartz. This has been the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. And until next time, take care, everybody.